the more I play around and try to adjust and try to change things, sometimes they don't get better. And so that's concerning to me. Like if I overdress, it's not better than just being basic and kind of timeless. And so I feel the same way with my face. I've done Botox. I've been really honest about that. I've done filler. Mm -hmm. I've been honest about that too. But I try to keep it within um, a framework that it doesn't become a burden to me. And I don't yeah. want to walk out the door and somebody go, wow, I love your new lips. Like, I don't. I, that's not for me. <laughs> There's only so much you're going to be able to change over time. Well, hello there. And welcome to this episode of the Terry Cole Show that I am so excited to bring you. I just had the most energizing and inspiring conversation with Tamsin Fidel. And you might know her because you've probably seen her on TV. She's an Emmy award-winning news anchor. She's an author. She's also a menopause advocate and a champion for women in their prime. I'm gonna say I'm one of them, maybe you are too. She is dedicated to supporting women as they move through various life stages, including career, menopause, and midlife. I met her through a mutual friend, Selena Sue, and then I started following her. I think it was over the pandemic. So in 2020, she started to share her experience as a woman in midlife. So she was, I think she was turning 50 that year and she has a podcast. So she was talking about it on the podcast. The podcast is called Coming Up Next with Tamsin Fidel. And each week she interviews thought leaders and authors and experts about embracing the next chapter, right? It's like life isn't over when you're over 40, right? Life is just beginning. Tamsin is super passionate about the arts, but she's also an executive producer and host of a nationally syndicated program, The Broadway Show, which is where I actually first saw her years ago in New York, highlighting the stories of people who create Broadway shows both on and off the stage. So I had so much fun talking to her and she was so candid about her menopause experience and life experience. And we talk about aging and we talk about Botox and we talk about all the things. So I really hope that you enjoyed this interview with Tamsin Fidel as much as I really did enjoy interviewing her. Super duper, duper excited to welcome Tamsin Fidel to the Terry Cole Show. Hi, Tamsin. Hi. I'm excited Thanks. to be here. I'm so happy you're here. Um, okay, so I was telling everyone at the top all, all the ways that I found you. I think I met you originally through Selena Sue. And then obsessively started following me on social because you have so much empowering and great uh, stuff to say, talking about midlife, turning 50, 51, 52, all the things. So there's a million questions that I have, so many things I want to talk about. One thing that was really um, inspirational for me, I loved it. You posted, and I think it's pinned on your Insta, for your birthday, you uh -huh. talked about like 14 things that you learned. So can we talk a little bit about those things? Yeah, I love it. Uh, I turned 52 in December and it was, I did, actually did uh, 52 things I want for you, you know, at 52 years old. And so we did them in segments. We broke them up, like you said. And, you know, it was, um, I started making the list. And I'm thinking like, there is no way I'm going to be able to get to 52 things of, of advice, of things I've learned in the past 52 years. And then I couldn't stop the list, you know, because um, <laughs> I just feel like we've we've been through a lot, right? We've we've mm -hmm. changed a lot in the last however many decades we've been on this earth. But I think we've also learned a lot of lessons that perhaps we wish somebody had told us. Maybe they did, maybe it was in conversation, but we certainly didn't have the avenues or the platforms that we have now to talk about those yes. things. And so that's what made it exciting for me to do. So I just had a good time with it. Yeah, it was fun to see the things, people were adding things to the list. So I think we're overdue for another one actually. I agree. What I, I what I appreciate, Tamsin, about your style and about your wisdom is like you have all this lived experience that we all do, but you have a very succinct way of sharing it. So I'm, I'm going to quickly just go over some of the ones of this particular section oh, of yeah. the 52, which Thank is you. first impressions aren't based on looks. They're based on confidence. Fact. This is so true. The minute you see jealousy in a friend, get rid of them. <laughs> I was like, that one is amazing. Yeah. And let's talk a little bit about the less is more when it comes to makeup. And it's not even the makeup part that I want to talk about, but it's so true. But let's talk a little bit about aging and makeup, yeah. shall we? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, today's not a good example for me. I have a lot on because I just did a video uh, here in the studio. So you have to cake it on. But I feel like... Yes, uh, we do. Yes, <laughs> yes, you do. But an hour ago, it was not like this. You know, there's a couple of things. 
I don't know, three years ago, if you'd have told me I was going to get on any kind of camera without makeup to just kind of cover myself and make sure I looked presentable, like I thought, like I thought people wanted me to look, I, I would have said, you're crazy. I'm never doing that. Today, it's just different. I feel very raw about who I am. I feel like, like actually when I don't have makeup on, I can talk more honestly and from my gut. And I feel like with regard to aging, we, look, I'm a, I'm a makeup person. Like I enjoy it. I love it. I love testing out new products. I love playing around with it, but I don't have to have it to be able to exist in the world. And I think that that's an important lesson, you know, cause I, sometimes I see young women with so much makeup on and I think like, I don't know where you're going to go from here. And I was one of those young women. And so I think that that's why I, I talk a little bit about that. Cause I do think the less is more in that area. And I do find some of the women that are the most attractive that I run across are the ones that have, you know, little concealer, little mascara, and they're confident about going on with their day. And that makes me feel confident about, about who they are and what they're talking about. It's so true, but there's something about like, I've, I think part of why your work resonates so much with me is that I've, I'm, you just turned 52. I'm 52. Yeah. Yeah. 52. Right. And I just turned 59 actually a couple of days ago. Oh, happy birthday. Well, thanks. And I'd say I didn't really notice myself aging my face, like just the way you age that much until Mm -hmm. maybe my late forties or early fifties is where I started to really see a shift. And I've been going back and forth about how to manage it. So do I manage it outside of myself? You know, I'm in a partnership with someone who is very loving and loves me without makeup. And, you know, I mean, it's not like I I don't feel like I've got pressure in my personal life to look a particular way. It's my own Mm self-identity of, am I going to put my time and energy into embracing, like truly embracing this time in my life by having radical self-acceptance or am I going to do something to my face? I don't know. Like, like I'm, I'm on the fence about it still. <laughs> you know, it's, so it's a great question thoughts? though. Well, it's a great question. And look, it's, it's definitely one that I've, I've thought a lot about. Uh, I thought a lot about over the years. And I, I guess where I am right now and, and I've noticed it too. Like I've noticed it. Even if I go back and look at old pictures from a few years ago, I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. oh, oh, what happened to my eyes there? <laughs> <laughs> That's different. Um, you know, in, in my arms, but you know, it's all, all I, can, I can, you know, I could spend hours going through the list. I feel like for me, it's more about managing it both ways, inside and outside. Like, I, I think I have to, you know, I no, none of us are not getting there. It doesn't matter how much you do, we're not getting there. But I have noticed the more I play around and try to adjust and try to change things, sometimes they don't get better. And so that's concerning to me. Like if I overdress, it's not better than just being basic and kind of timeless. And so I feel the same way with my face. I've done Botox. I've been really honest about that. I've done filler. Mm -hmm. I've been honest about that too, but I try to keep it within um, a framework that it doesn't become a burden to me. And I don't want to walk out the door and somebody go, wow, I love your new lips. I don't, that's not for me (laughs) because it's too much maintenance for me, first of all. And and second of all, like there's only so much you're going to be able to change over time. So I think the maintenance part, I am totally with, like I I'm, that gives me confidence in myself, but not so much that it becomes a burden. And, um, And look, it it is about accepting it a different way and accepting different, I think I've noticed myself accepting different parts of myself, maybe a face a a long time or my smile or, you know, those were different things I accepted. And now my confidence is something I really, I work toward my confidence. You know, that's a bigger deal to me than making sure I don't have any wrinkles. Yeah. I mean, because here's the thing, we're going to have wrinkles, but it's like, it's a real thing, which is why Mm -hmm. I appreciate this conversation that it's a real thing because especially if you live anywhere in the public eye because here's the thing if i didn't have a public platform if you weren't on tv like would we be seeing ourselves all the time no right and so the the confidence piece i think that you're talking about like i used to represent uh supermodels and celebrities uh, as a talent agent before i did this and people used to say you know does that make you feel insecure. And I was like offended at the time. I was like, wow, no, because why would I be comparing myself to Naomi (laughs) Campbell or Cindy Crawford or anybody? And also, even then I always was like, my whole thing is my mind. 
Like yeah. my thing that makes me unique yeah. is my brain, is my original thoughts, is my writing, is whatever it is. And so I'm, I still feel that way. And yet I, and, and I'm, I'm with you, Tamsin. It's like, do what I can to stay physically well. But I feel like there's this place, there's this conversation that a lot of women we have with each other that we don't mm -hmm. have publicly. So I appreciate you mm -hmm. having this one publicly with me, but Hi. this is what it is. I have, I have friends who've done the full facelift thing who were just turned 50 getting that done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They look amazing. It yeah. cost a zillion dollars. Yep. They don't look weird. They don't look tight. You know, people are, people will always say, well, it's, it's weird. You know, like, are you going to look weird? My whole thing is because I, I was looking at this, someone, someone has sent me something, a plastic surgeon in Charlottesville, Virginia, who does all this amazing work and the work is amazing. And then I had this whole realization in looking at it. I was like, but that's like me being this age and having my 30 year old face. Like mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. fucking weird too. <laughs> like I, I literally had a realization. I was like, if I could be Benjamin Button, do I want to be, do, or do is it about, that? right? Is it about shifting the conversation and opening up the conversation and shifting the perception of beauty and aging? What are your thoughts? I, I well, you know, it's interesting because I, I, um, I think that we talk about it and we talk about um, beauty and aging, but then we fear it at the same time, right? Like, mm -hmm. like we do, we just do. And I think that's human nature. And I think what I, I believe, I guess that at this point in my life is that I want to try to be as authentic to myself first mm -hmm. before anybody else. And uh, because that's easier to live with. And I don't yeah. want to be saying like, Hey, you should really believe in yourself, but I'm going to go change everything about myself. So I look like <laughs> my old self, not my current self. Cause so I never want somebody right. to say, and, and I get those comments. I'm sure you get them too. Like I said, something I said, less is more. And somebody goes, Oh, well, you have a ton of clothes. And I said, yeah, but I wear them. Like I'm less is more for me is always about like clutter that, you know, is not, you're not using, it's not emotion. Norma Kamali told me about that. Like, just like when she had clutter around her house, she couldn't creatively think. And I never forgot that. And, um, and I really believe in it, but I, but I want to authentically be able to believe what I'm saying, you know, I'm going to live what I'm saying. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to do it the wrong way. I don't, I don't want to, and I don't want it to be so hard at the end of the day. Like I, I spoke at this conference about a month ago and my husband came to watch the last part of it. And I said, because I had said this to him a couple of nights before at home. I said, you know, like 20, when I was 25 years old, it took me five minutes to like get into bed. I'd brush my teeth. If I remember to do that, I took off my mascara. If I remember to do that. And I hopped into bed and now it's like a half an hour, a hard half an hour of putting potions in me, on me, over me, behind my ears, but you know, every which way that they could be to like correct whatever thing. And I said, I'm kind of, I'm kind of getting tired of it. I got to bring that down to the five minutes again, that five minute rule. Cause it's exhausting, but, yes. but you know, I don't want it to be so difficult and I don't think it should be right. so difficult. And that doesn't mean not take care of yourself. That doesn't mean not to do the things that, that make you well. But I just think that the pressure we put on ourselves or we, or we feel from the outside and then as a consequence put on ourselves can be unfair oftentimes, I you agree. know, and, and exhausting. Like yeah. th that's the whole thing is that it's so tiring. And I'm with you. It's like, it's enough to like floss, brush, wash, cream. <laughs> like, I, I, I mean, can't, if it's 10 minutes. By the time I do that, I don't even want to do anything when I get in bed. I'm like, Ugh, it's been 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm exhausted, right? There's something else that you've really been shining a light on that I really appreciate. And I also talk about in my show and in my life, it's menopause and your experiences of menopause. And it's funny, we were supposed to do this interview and then it didn't end up happening. And now we're doing it now. Yeah. And before, like not even a couple of days ago, Drew Barrymore was yeah. talking on her show about like having a hot, she was literally like in real time yeah. having a hot flash. Yeah. And I thought, wow, this is just so great. It's like what, what you've been doing. So I want to talk a little bit about you, first of all, why you're shining a light intentionally and yeah. opening up this dialogue about menopause. I mean, I so appreciate it. And obviously I could guess your reasons, but I want to hear your reasons. 
Yeah, I uh, I was telling somebody um, a few days ago. I never, I was never intending to be a poster child for menopause, um, but it just mm-hmm. happened. You know, I had an experience at work in the workplace, and um, it was on the set. And luckily, I had you know some colleagues that were around and were like, you know, you should get off the set. You don't look so great. And um, it was it was a hot flash. My heart was racing out of control. It became anxiety, and it was like I couldn't even. I could hear my heart like, you know, really just pounding. I could hear it in my ears. And I had been having a hard time reading the teleprompter um, leading up to that on and off, and uh, was getting a little nervous about it. And it was kicking my confidence. Like it was just really making me nervous to do anything except just try to read the prompter, and not. You know what I do? I ad lib and can talk, and I right. I didn't feel comfortable doing it because I was in the the constant word search. Like, what's the word? I'm trying to, you know, and it wasn't cute and funny. It was terrifying. That happened, and I ended up on the floor of the bathroom. And uh, I went home. That it was a Friday night, and I went home. And I'm like, what in the hell? Like, what is going on? Like, I don't even know. But I was scared. And then I was frustrated. And um, so I, you know, my gynecologist, I'd been to uh, several different times in the recent years because I have endometrium polyps. So I had excessive bleeding uh, as a result of the polyps. And also it turns out perimenopause. However, no one said to me, hey, maybe you're having those problems and you have to get up every commercial break to, you know, change your your pad and tampon because you're in perimenopause. No one ever told me that it was endometrium polyps. So I never knew that there was an end, you know, 12 months, then your period's over and you go into menopause. Right. My mother died of breast cancer when she was uh, 51. And um, so I never, we never had that conversation. I think she went into menopause, uh, you know, as a result of surgical menopause. And so I didn't initially set out to talk about it here. I actually was doing research on it from, with my podcast. I'm like, I'm going to create a podcast. I can talk about, the, I, I interview people about this because I know nothing about it. And I, I crept mm-hmm. into it, you know, talk, talk, talk. And then I went on TikTok. And that was the first thing I did. I went on TikTok and I read the 34 symptoms of menopause. And I was so shocked by them. I'm like, there's 34 symptoms? What? And so I read them. I just read them. And that video just took off and people were adding symptoms and saying like they couldn't believe it. They didn't know. And so the conversation started there. And then about six months after that, I kind of boldly put out one video on Instagram thinking, like, let me see if this audience is not, you know, is, is okay with it. Cause I was a little afraid. I didn't know what people were going to think. And now sure. people are like, Oh, everyone talks about it. And I go, no, everyone doesn't talk about it. Like that's the problem. No. That's why it feels, you know, like it, some people are talking about it. So I was a little nervous about it. And I put the video out. And then I just had so many people respond to it. And um, even before I came in here to sit down and talk to you, somebody stopped me and said, "Um, I just want to thank you because you're allowing my girlfriends and I to have a conversation. And now that's the reason I'm doing it. And so I want women who are in the workplace. I want women who are whatever they're doing, running around at this age, maybe just need a little bit of a, a boost or a little bit of something to be able to have mm-hmm. that conversation freely with their family, with their partners, with their children, with their doctors, because there was so much I didn't know. And I am um, so grateful for so many doctors that have now jumped into this and said, hey, I'm going to take a stand too and have this conversation and, um, and, and fight for more education and uh, you know fight for different ways for workplaces to change policy and to encourage people to come forward and encourage people not to be afraid to talk about it at work and to normalize that conversation. Because I kept hearing the word taboo all the time. And I hated it. I, like, I hate hearing that that, uh, you know, oh, it's so taboo. And I, I thought like that, that's the least thing that should be taboo. So anyway, that's why. <laughs> it's so needed. And part of why you're uniquely sort of suited to do it is because of your authenticity, right? This is what, what we feel when we are, I mean, you guys, all this stuff, obviously go follow her on TikTok, Instagram though, like literally I'm, I'm obsessed with your Instagram. It's so helpful. Thank you. <laughs> I'm having a good time doing it because it feels nice to be able to just get up in the morning and do it and not think about it and not try to get your makeup ready for the day or put together an idea, like we just do stuff. And, um, and I, and I like that, you know, it's very different from anything that I've done in the past. Everything used to be like on script and now it's way off script, (laughs) but, but it's also, uh, it's not everything. So much of what you've done in your professional career, because you've had an extensive professional career, of course, is so produced. And it's like, you're doing something now that you're producing it the way that it works for you and what comes through. Because I always liked, I always, you know, after Selena turned me on to your stuff, I always like, liked you and followed your professional stuff too. But this is, different because what I really feel like is happening is you're giving us permission 
to be ourselves and to not feel like it all, you have to have it all perfect because of course this is part of the problem. And part of the problem is this perfectionism, mm -hmm. this thing that oh. I, it's like, I must control how you perceive, perceive me. Perceive me. Yep. Right. Rather You're than so right. the, who am I? Right. Who, who am I? And am I sharing from a place of being my actual self? And there is something so liberating mm. about doing it. So your podcast, people can get that everywhere. It's on Apple podcasts and it's coming up yeah. next, yeah. um, midlife menopause and finding meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I kept, I kept thinking like, what is, what is it going to be about? And then everybody I would talk to, you know, it started out with menopause. And then I said, well, I've got to, I've got to move into other areas because you can't really separate menopause and midlife because there are so many things that happen all at the same time, you know? And then I thought, but the big thread through everything is really about meaning. It's really at this stage for me anyway, it's about doing things that, are, that mean something, not just to me, but to other people. And that um, are going to have meaning down the line when I'm not here. You know, that's, that's really, right. I think what's important to me. And, um, my, my life's changed a lot. You know, I got married at the age of 50 for a second time. I lost my stepmother to uh, breast cancer as well after losing my mother. So I, I had, a, um, some big changes, big shifts. And I just, I don't know, I, I guess I took a little bit of time somewhere in there to realize what was important uh, to me and what I want to do in my next <laughs> iteration. And, um, it's nice to be able to do it all at the same time. And, uh, this conversation is just getting louder. I think, and, and I've met so many incredible women that lift each other up. You can pick up the phone or text them and call and say, can you help me with something or have a question? And you don't feel this competitive thing. I think that we felt in our twenties, like it just, it feels mm -hmm. good. And I feel like I'm whole, you know, and that's a different feeling yeah. than I've ever had. That's amazing. So, so what did you learn? Can I switch gears quickly? Sure. What did you learn from, you know, getting married at 50? Like, mm -hmm. how is that different from getting married, however old you were when you first, we got married for your first time? Yeah, my first time, I think I was, um, I think I was 20, uh, 37. So I, mm -hmm. it's interesting. So the, the type of person I chose is clearly very different. I said, I always say to my husband, like, I don't think I would have chose you in my thirties. I was looking for like this bad boy who was going to change the world, you know, and instead my husband is so like, um, cool in terms of easygoing and, and somebody that's not, you know, he's, he's like, I got up yesterday morning and I was like, what are you doing? He goes, I'm reading. And it was like the like third newspaper he'd read, you know, and I'm like, what? That's so weird. And I just went back to sleep for another hour. So I, I just, I said, we're so like, different in so many ways and so um, fun in so many ways. Like I really enjoy him and I don't have to think about it too much. Like I enjoy getting the phone when he calls. I don't, I don't look at the phone and roll my eyes. I enjoy our time together. I enjoy when we're alone or with somebody else. And is everything absolutely perfect all the time? Of course not. Like that would be insane to think that, but it's just easy. And that's what I was looking for now. And where I was before in my other relationship, you know, I look back on it and I realize what it was. And um, there were really some unhealthy parts of that relationship. And I, you know, I think we can all look back and, and judge or criticize something, but there were really unhealthy parts that made me unhealthy about myself and maybe him too, but made me unhealthy about myself. So I feel uh, whole. You know, I feel whole, not because I have a partner, but just whole in myself and everything that's going on. And that's a nice addition to it as well. Yeah. There's something that you would put online and I'd, I'd responded to it about basically being in a relationship with someone who you don't have to like make yourself smaller for, or you don't have to yeah. settle yeah. for like having not all nice. of these unmet needs. Yeah. And the more you know yourself, right? I didn't get married till I was 35, but, and I never thought I would get married, right? I actually wasn't that interested in getting married. And I've been married <laughs> twice now. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if you were interested in it. <laughs> I'm sure I wanted to do it. <sighs> but there was something about that, you know, because of my, my parents' marriage that I had this feeling like marriage is going to be giving something up that yeah. I don't want to give yeah. up or marriage is going to be oh, so true. My independence, making my myself freedom. small. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so reading you know, reading your thing, I was like, yes, that's exactly it. And I always like to describe my relationship with my husband as being securely tethered and completely free simultaneously. Oh, I like that. 
I like that. I, I so get that too, because I, I, I feel the same way. You know, I think we've all been in these relationships so that you have to kind of twist yourself into a pretzel and apologize for success. And I always found that um, anybody I would date or married the first time would hate me for the same reasons I think that they fell in love with me or started to like mm-hmm. me, you know, and it was ambition or success or wanting more or, you know, wanting to uh, being curious all the time. Like, can't you just be happy? Can't you just be, you know, settle? And I don't ever have to apologize. Like I don't apologize anymore for being who I am in the relationship. And I think that that's part of the relationship I chose and part who I am now. And I really like that. It's, it's really nice. It sure takes a, it's a whole lot. There's no pressure there. It's not like, this whole other thing that causes pressure. It's not like another part-time job, you know? And I feel like sometimes relationships can be that like part-time job of dealing with it. And it's not like that. And I I really do enjoy that. And I think uh, it's, it's a little bit of both of us and it's a little bit of the time where we are in our lives. Um, But I also think it's what we both bring to it and the expectations that we don't have from it, which is important. That that they're just as important as the ones that you do. Yeah, absolutely. I I feel like, you know, when we're younger, at least for me, I was so highly codependent. I was just managing yeah, the crap out of every relationship that I was in. I was managing yep. that person. It yep. wasn't even like just being in the relationship. It was like, <laughs> I'm going to make you better. I'm going to change yep. the way you dress. Oh my gosh, I'm that's gonna... so true. <laughs> I'm going to fix why? you. <laughs> I don't know why. I think about all the time I wasted making to-do lists for my ex-husband of like what he should do to get up in the morning to be, you know, to get in, 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 in it came where he would rely on them. And, and then I couldn't get him to do something without having a to-do list. I became his mother. Yeah. And then like, there's nothing hot about that for sure. So it's so nice that my <laughs> husband does his own thing. He doesn't, he doesn't need my help doing it. If I, you know, I like, I always like to insert my opinion in, in everything, but, um, but he doesn't need it is what I'm saying at the end of the day. Yes. Yes. I remember when I was first with my husband, I don't know what it was. It was something that he was wearing. Oh, he's, he's first generation American and he wears a Speedo. He still wears a Speedo. (laughs) And I remember being like, wait, is this dude wearing a Speedo? Oh my God. And he looked great in it, but I still was like, I mean, if you're not like on the Olympic swim team, I'm pretty sure you probably shouldn't be wearing that. And (laughs) he didn't care. Like, I sort of ribbed him a little bit about it, but he, he like laughed and was like, yeah, it's what I like. That was that. And I was like, well, that's refreshing. I guess I don't need to manage what he's wearing to the beach because right. it's none of my friggin' business. <laughs> right, right, right. I know, I know, but it's hard. Like if, when you're used to doing that and it's easy for you to do, mm-hmm. you know, it can be very easy, especially when you're a multitasker. Like I can manage this, I can do this, I can do work, work and deal with the speedo. <laughs> so I get it. <laughs> So I want one last topic that I, well, two, two last mm-hmm. things. One is you shared that, you know, you had this in your mind, like I'm never going on hormone replacement because my mother yeah. died of cancer and I have a lot yeah. of breast cancer history in my family of origin yeah. as well. And I was similarly influenced. So please tell, tell us a little bit why you had that attitude and what has changed. Yeah. I, um, you know, I was very scared about that. And I, I had that you know, a thought in the back of my head all the time, but I didn't ever know where it came from because I didn't know that what I was actually quoting in my head were headlines that, you know, had, I learned somewhere. And I don't ever even remember that study in 2002. You know, I don't remember hearing about it, but I must have, right? Somehow, or that mm-hmm. headline came to me. And um, I always thought estrogen was dangerous. And when I went into menopause, I was like, I'm going to do everything natural. I'm, I'm going to take my maca powder and that's it. I'm not going to do anything else. And I had really debilitating symptoms and I had symptoms that really gave uh, me a tough time at work. Like I, like I said, the brain fog is real. It's not aha uh-huh, funny. I can't remember a word. It was debilitating and it was scary. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, something that made work very difficult for me and just life in general. And on top of uh, moodiness and depression, which originally they had prescribed me uh, antidepressants, but the other symptoms didn't go away and not being able to sleep and the lack of sleep was another thing like you, you have lack of sleep and you feel like you're losing it at all times. And so that's, that's really yeah. what I went through for a good year plus. And it was bad. And I, and I thought, well, you know, you're just going to deal with it. You're going to get through, you're going to get the other side. And I couldn't ever get to the other side. It just felt like it kept getting worse. And um, so I went and I saw a couple of different doctors and the, the first gynecologist the office that I had been to for a long time that I had seen, they were like, well, you know, if you really need to do hormones, uh, and the second one I went to gave me uh, estrogen 
they had done like blood tests on me and she said, Oh, I can't wait to get on estrogen to help my skin. And I, I thought like, that's not the reason I'm going to take estrogen and progesterone. <laughs> she gave it to me. It sat in my cabinet, the, the, the progesterone pills gel, you know, they're the little, like they look plasticky looking pills. They gelled together, like congeal. They were sold. And then I finally <laughs> found a doctor that, uh, cause I was just desperate, like desperate feeling all the time, like we're not getting out of bed, things that were so off of who I was. The next doctor I went to was somebody who had actually written a book and was somebody I'd interviewed on the podcast. And when she talked about it, when I read it, I was like, wait a minute, maybe I'm misinformed. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. I have such a fear of breast cancer my whole life because of my mother. And then my stepmother, I just, you know, I was scared. And she explained to me what was going on and explained to me the headlines, explained to me the the study had been halted, explained to me that the slight, slight risk of different things, but the out, that outweighed all the, you know, the benefits that were outweighed by uh, estrogen and progesterone. And I don't take those decisions lightly and certainly not to talk about because I feel like people still judge you on that. But um, I decided to do that and it changed my life. It really did. I'm on a patch that I change uh, twice a week. I'm on a progesterone pill that you, you obviously take nightly because I have to do that. And it's changed my life. I sleep. I wouldn't have been able to have a coherent conversation with you uh, three years ago, two years ago. Wow. Yeah. That's so yeah. amazing. And it sounds like we're on like the same protocol. So I think so. I, and that has really worked for me as well. Yeah. And it's wonderful. It's, again, it's not for everybody, you know, and I, but it's it been good for me. <laughs> That's exactly what I was just going to say. Yeah. We're not medical doctors. We're just <laughs> telling you what worked for us and to get educated. Like what I hope yeah. that people will take away besides following you and listening to your pod, because you were very inspirational, my friend, is find out, right? Yeah. Push back, ask questions. Yeah. And I have to say for me, I, I am really into having female doctors, especially around menopause. Like me too. That's. For me, that's my preference, right? I, I talk about our boundaries, mm -hmm. right? Your preferences, your desires, your limits, your deal breakers, those are your boundaries. This is my preference yep. to talk to someone, yep. especially, and I like the idea of it being someone old enough <laughs> who maybe has gone through menopause themselves. Yeah, and I agree. can understand agree. that it, it's so different for every person. Some of my friends died with hot flashes. I really didn't have that at all, but I had what you had. I had the insomnia. Yeah. I also had really painful uh, sex. I yeah, had lack of too. libido. I was like, yeah, wait, me too. What, what is yeah, happening right too. now? I call my myself a menopausal help. bride. I was like the menopausal <laughs> bride at 50 years old. And then I hit menopause. I'm like, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'd rather read people. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> All right. I have one more question for you. Yeah. Personally, what has been your most challenging boundary struggle and how did you overcome it if you have? Oh, boundary struggle. Gosh, there's been quite a few saying yes, saying yes to everything. <laughs> That's been a really tough one. My boundary, uh, you know, I'm very open and, um, and I want to, uh, help, but sometimes I'm like, yes, 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 yes. And then at the end of the day, I go into a week and I go, what did I do? And so that's been a tough one for me um, throughout the years because I'm a people pleaser. And, um, so I've really tried to learn, uh, that I had to please myself first and had to be okay with myself first. And that's a lesson that I repeat to myself every day. And so I'll go to the next week and I'll be like, what's on this calendar that, you know, that shouldn't be, or I can consolidate, or I can move to a day that I have a little more freedom to be able to do something. Cause I realized overextending myself doesn't help me or anybody else that I'm doing things for. So I'd like to be in the moment and be able to concentrate on exactly what I'm doing uh, with that person. It's a boundary for me and a respect for them. Love it. All right. So tell everyone where they can find you. Oh yeah. At Tamson Fidel and Instagram and pretty much that's my handle everywhere. And then I have a website, TamsonFidel.com as well. Um, and I have a newsletter there and then my podcast you can link to there as well. Well, I just want to say Tamson, this has been a pleasure and I super appreciate what you're doing in the world. Thank you. And I say, let's do this again. I would love it. Thank you.